Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 77. We're going to be there the whole morning. There are two places in Scripture that I've spent a lot of my personal time as a pastor. Uh, of course, as a pastor, I'm preaching the Word every week. I'm preaching Galatians right now with the youth. But I don't let that be my only Bible reading. My personal time has been in a Bible reading plan and lately in the Psalms, which is one place that I love to be, and then also in what we call the pastoral epistles. Those are three letters in the New Testament that are written specifically to pastors, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, I've got a couple of these scripture notebooks that are just those three pastoral epistles. You see we've got the Bible on one side and then just a notebook paper on the other side for taking notes. Uh, these are so important for me to be in. I read these because I need to remember what God has called me to as a pastor in this church and with our youth group. I could become a babysitter or a security guard or a teacher or a funkel or a guru, but none of those things is quite what a pastor is. And reading these pastoral epistles reminds me of my calling. In 1 Timothy 1.5, I'm given a goal to aim for in my instruction, in my teaching. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Sincere faith. I'm going to take you to a place in the Psalms that is targeted like a heat-seeking missile at your sincere faith. I said I love the Psalms. Why I love the Psalms, I've always had a hard time being around inauthentic people. I don't like fake. I like real people. My heart is just drawn to the raw way that the Psalms talk. They're honest, they're real, and I have needed the Psalms as I feel a lot of strong feelings. The Psalms are such a welcoming place to go with strong feelings because... The way that God wrote them, they are intentionally generic, so they're very applicable. Most of the Psalms bring you to a point of worship or hope. They might start desperate, calling out to God, but by the end, there's worship. There's a turning around. And some don't end that way and just end in the dark. I like how honest that is. I'm taking you to Psalm 77 because I want to help you with your sincere faith. I want to help you build confidence in God. I want to give you protection from anxiety, protection from fear of the unknown. I'm going to give you stability. I want to help you be a people who have peaceful hearts when everything around you seems to be falling apart. Because we're going to be persecuted, we're going to be tested, we're going to be tempted, and the world is full of suffering. God's faithfulness in the past give us strength and stability in the now. Hopefully you're there with me in Psalm 77. Let's pray together, and then let's come into the psalm. Father, open our eyes. Open the eyes of our hearts to behold wonderful things from your word. Incline our hearts to your testimonies. Satisfy us this morning, Father, with your loving kindness. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Teach us to go to you for the refuge that we need. Make your church at Summit Ridge place where people have peace and stability because they know who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory as we trust him. Amen. Hopefully you're there with me in Psalm 77. There is a title for the choir director, according to Jedithon of Asaph, a psalm. Jedithon was a contemporary of David. He was one of David's chief musicians. 
But this was not written in the time of Jeduthun. This was probably in the style of music that Jeduthun introduced. Asaph was another of David's contemporaries, but he was also the ancestor of a group of temple musicians. The commentators say this was a pseudonym for one of Asaph's descendants sometime after David's lifetime. The timing of this psalm gets a little important later. Here's the content of the psalm, first verse. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. Have you spent much time praying out loud? Our norm is head bowed, eyes closed, silent. You grew up praying in the church, maybe fold your hands. The ancient norm was out loud, eyes open, hands lifted to heaven. This is how people prayed then. One is not right or wrong. You can pray anywhere in any position. But Asaph is making sure we understand he was praying loudly and he didn't care who else heard him. Verse 2, I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refused to be comforted. I think of God. I groan. I meditate. My spirit becomes weak. Selah. The Bible might have a footnote. We have mostly lost the meaning of Salah. It might be a musical interlude or a pause. You have kept me from closing my eyes. I am troubled and cannot speak. I consider days of old, years long past. At night I remember my music. I meditate in my heart and my spirit ponders. That phrase, I'm, at night I remember my music, commentators point out and Bible translations go different directions with this. It could mean that he remembers when his nights were filled with joyful songs. That's how the NLT interprets it. Or it could mean I'm sitting up with my lute all night long, as the message interprets. I know this. When I go to a friend's house and he has his guitar out, I know he's been struggling and I know that he's been playing worship music. Preaching to his heart, trying to get in the right, the right place. When I pick up my bass, you might not know, I play bass on Sunday morning sometimes. Uh, shameful confession, I didn't get into bass to play worship music. If I'm playing my bass at home, I might be kicking on a distortion pedal and I might be expressing something a little different. I might be expressing anger, frustration, uh, cathartically. So we don't quite know, and that's a cool thing about this psalm. It's got a lot of we don't know, but it feels relatable. I think that that is just the kind intention of God for this psalm to be able to fit his different children in different ways. Hear me right. The Bible is not open to us just making it what we want it to be. But God has intentionally given the psalms to us without a lot of context open for us to personalize and take these words on our lips. This is a long, bad night. His hands are lifted up all night long. One of those nights you get no sleep. Nothing is comforting him, and he's refusing to turn to the things that could comfort him. In modern terms, he's leaving his phone on the nightstand. He's not doom-scrolling. He's not going for a midnight snack. He's not going to self-soothe with a drink in the living room or some kind of distracting sexual sin. He is wrestling with God, and it is a long night. Now here's what's troubling him. Verse 7. Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Selah. So I say, I am grieved that the right hand of the Most High has changed. 
These are the hard questions. He's struggling. He's not seeing God's promises come to pass. What are the promises we struggle with? I thought God loved me. That he promised to be faithful to me and show me love. But his love doesn't feel very good. Why cancer? Why death? Why job loss? Why migraines? Why do I always feel bad? I think I've felt good one day out of about the last two weeks. I thought he hated injustice and he stands up for outcasts and the lowly, but my boss is terrible to me. Not Pastor John, of course. My spouse is cold and controlling. Not you, Tiffany. Kind of scary and crazy and mean. You have your moments. I guess I'll be making my own lunch today. (laughs) Maybe you feel like a second-class citizen because of the color of your skin. He hated injustice, but my parents, my classmates, the way I was betrayed. He said he'd love me and forgive me and never leave me or forsake me. And Romans 8.28, he promised he'd work all things together for my good. But we have loved ones. For most of us, we'd rather experience suffering ourselves than to watch a loved one go through that same suffering. Why is he letting their memory degrade? Why isn't he answering my prayers that they would be healed? I thought he promised. Why isn't he softening their hearts so that they lean on him? Why hasn't he saved this person I love? So we feel with the psalmist, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? These are promises that we struggle with. The psalmist Asaph had a different set of promises that he was struggling with. God had promised special care for Israel and that a Messiah would come. Last time I preached on a Sunday morning, a couple weeks ago, Hagar and Ishmael, I talked about the promises that God made to Abraham. You remember there were some big promises. A permanent inheritance of the promised land, offspring more numerous than the stars in the night sky. And we don't really know what that looks like, but is free from the light pollution of casinos and hotels and spheres and stadiums. There are actually stars up there. But then God made specific messianic promises to Abraham too at that time. He would bless the world through Abraham's seed. And he would be the God of the people of Israel. As time went on, God has made it clear that David is the next step. We'll bring 2 Samuel 7 up on the screen. This is the Davidic covenant. God promises that he will make a great name for David like no other name. A place for his people where they will dwell safely and rest from all their enemies. 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16. When your time comes, this is God speaking to King David as he's making this Davidic covenant. When your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and literally David's son Solomon did build the temple in Jerusalem. And God says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. This is starting to sound a little like Jesus. When he does wrong, so now we're back to Solomon, when he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows from mortals, but my faithful love will never leave him as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you, David. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. David had many sons. But after this Davidic covenant, 1 Chronicles 22.6 show that this covenant will be fulfilled through a specific son, his son Solomon. 
And we'll bring that up on the screen. You can read that. The Davidic covenant will continue through David's son, Solomon. And so Asaph was aware of all of these things, these promises. And the psalmist was aware of more, too. The messianic promises uh, and prophecies like Isaiah 9. We remember Isaiah 9 from around Christmas. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. And then this sounds familiar, right? For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Asaph was familiar with this. Micah 5 would be another. Asaph knows the promises of God to bring a Messiah to establish a permanent kingdom. But things have fallen apart. People might have wondered if David would be the great Messiah. And then Solomon after him, they would have wondered. But each king in that that promised bloodline has brought more disappointment. Hope is withering. Hope is being suffocated for the people of God. Right after Solomon's lifetime, The kingdom of Israel was divided into just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin in the south under Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Israel made up of the other ten-ish tribes in the north. Two to ten, but Judah in the south, the small one is the blessed one, run by kings from Solomon's bloodline, loyal to the Davidic dynasty. Capital is in Jerusalem, where the temple is. The northern kingdom is mostly short-lived rulers. There's lots of coups. And those ten tribes were conquered and dispersed and basically lost in 722 B.C., shortly after that prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9 that we just read. Things have been going down. I'm going to take a break and just want to say about history and history in the Bible. As we talk history, I've always been really bad at remembering specifics with this kind of stuff. Pastor Mark last week gave a history lesson, and in in this one too, the point. The point for you is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. There's not a test on this. We don't have the security team uh, standing at the door, keeping you from going to your cars and lunch if you don't know that the northern kingdom fell in 722 B.C. It's going to be okay if you're pretty fuzzy on the details. I've been to seminary. I have to brush up when we get into the history of things like this. But I want you to hold on to the big brush strokes here so that you don't feel so intimidated by your Bible. Big book, a lot of pages, small print, thin paper. I don't want you to be intimidated by it. I think a lot of Christians don't read their Bible because they don't know it very well, and they don't know it very well because they don't read it. And I want to help you break that cycle. So what we're teaching today sort of summarizes six books of the Old Testament. This kingdom stuff is first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. Six big books of the Old Testament we're summarizing here. And I want you to get the point, the big picture here, so that when you're reading these passages of Scripture, you remember the big picture. You get the Reader's Digest version, and it can help you remember what matters in the long storytelling of these books as you watch king after king. There's a little more history coming this morning. It's going to be worth it, I promise. Let's get a little closer to our psalm now. There's not a timestamp on this psalm. You know, some of the psalms say a psalm of David when Doeg the Edomite, thus and such, or when he was hiding in a cave from Saul, that sort of thing. But as much as the commentators can tell, it's probably been a while since the ten tribes have been conquered, and it's almost time for the second one to go down too. 
the second kingdom in the south, the one with the kings that are descended from David and Solomon, it's going to be conquered soon. And Asaph is, is well aware. He sees the writing on the wall. He knows big bad things are coming. We in the United States, we feel this ominous sense that October and Halloween is not going to be nearly as scary as November and election season. We feel this ominous sense that our upcoming election is going to be big either way. Asaph gets it as he sees his nation not only struggling, but far worse. We need hope. Hope sustains us through the hardest things. One of the biggest learned fears in America and the Western world is you don't grow up afraid of the dentist, but after your first visit or two, you start to fear the dentist. We are afraid of the dentist. Most of us have some fear of the dentist, but if you're hurting and you have hope that your mouth will feel better after going to the dentist, you will go in for that root canal. Hope will give you the power to do that hard thing. Hope sustains. And hope deferred makes the heart sick. I traveled for work for years. Two weeks gone, a week home. Three weeks gone, a week home. And there were those trips where I thought I was gone for a week and it turned into two and then it turned into three and I was planning to come home at a certain time and I found out that I had to stay longer than planned, and I I know that wisdom of the Proverbs that says, hope deferred makes a heart sick. But when hope is lost, hope lost is despair, and we are undone. If you have hope of a promise of Messiah coming to right all that is wrong, you can be brave and say this is only temporary. But one of the hardest things for a lover of God and living through the Psalm 77 timeline in Israel's history is a curse. A terrible curse that most of us don't even remember from our Bible study, but that would have made hope wither This is like the worst case scenario of promises we struggle with. In Jeremiah 22, verses 24 through 30, God had generations ago, like we talked about, made a covenant with David and promised a special bloodline through him. And yet for the sins of the kings, especially for the sin of David's descendant Jehoiachin, who is also called Jeconiah or Keniah for short, it's great, he's got Renames, so super easy to track with, right? For the sin of David's descendant Jehoiachin, the Lord pronounces a curse that seems to show he's done with his covenant. Here's the text of the curse, Jeremiah 22, 24 through 27. As I live, this is the Lord's declaration, though you, Kaniah, son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would tear you from it. In fact, I will hand you over to those you dread who intend to take your life. The Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon and the Chaldeans, I will hurl you and the mother who gave birth to you into another land. The Lord throws in a your mom burn. Where neither of you were born and there you will both die. They will never return to the land they long to return to. And then continuing in Jeremiah twenty two thirty, this is what the Lord says, record this man as childless, a man who will not be successful in his lifetime. None of his descendants will succeed in sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. This is the messianic bloodline. No one from Kaniah's seed will sit on the throne. How is Messiah possible then? This curse on Jeconiah in 597 BC was 
possibly around the same time Psalm 77 was authored. This was likely before the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, as Jeremiah was prophesying. We're looking at a time when God's people could have really wondered if all was lost. This is about as bad as it's ever been. Let's reread verses 7 through 10 in that light. Follow along. Will the Lord reject forever, verse 7, and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Selah. Let's get Scott and the worship team up to do a musical interlude. So I say, I am grieved that the right hand of the Most High has changed. He goes on, verse 11. I will remember the Lord's works. L-O-R-D, lowercase, all caps. This is the Hebrew Yahweh, God's covenant name, when he appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And God says, tell them that I am has sent you. I am that I am, Yahweh, his covenant name. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions. In verses 11 through 12, Asaph resolves to remember. The present is dismaying. The future is uncertain but gloomy. So he determines to look to the past with a commitment to actively hold God's ways in front of his mind's eye. He talks about ancient wonders. These wonders do feel ancient, not recent at all. But he invokes that covenant name for the first time in this whole psalm. And then in verse 13, he's back to God. Track the things that you call God. Sometimes you pray to him as Father, sometimes you pray to him as Lord, sometimes you pray to him as God, and maybe you'll notice things about how near or far you feel from him as you use different names for him. 13, God, your way is holy. Look at the beautiful Hebrew poetry here as he talks about the Exodus, God leading the people of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. What God is great like God? You are the God who works wonders. You revealed your strength among the peoples. With power, you redeemed your people. The descendants of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The water saw you, God. The water saw you. It trembled. Even the depths shook. The clouds poured down water. The storm clouds thundered, your arrows flashed back and forth. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth stood and quaked. Your way went through the sea and your path through the vast water. This is the parting of the Red Sea. But your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. curtain. The psalm ends. Take a poll. Do you think that this ends with faith or doubt? Does it, does it end good or does it end bad? Do you think it ended on a note of hope? Some hands. Do you think it ended with doubt? Some hands. The same hands even. PJ's a troublemaker. <laughs> He's doing his little triangle smile. <laughs> it's not clear. It could be interpreted either way. This is one of only a few gloomy psalms. It doesn't end with, I know this is all going to be good, and thank you, and I'm all good now. It's almost like he finally gave up and passed out. Picture the pen scrawling off the end of the page. This is one of the gloomiest psalms, the only one I can think of offhand that would be worse and not really landing on worship and hope is Psalm 88. That's that's easy to remember, 77, 88, multiples of 11. 
I was an engineer. This is a bad night because the nation and God's promises are falling apart. Where is hope? How could this possibly get better? And indeed, shortly after Judah, that southern kingdom in the Davidic dynasty, will be carried away to Babylon, Jeconiah, as cursed, will indeed never sit on the throne again. None of his children will be king. Jerusalem will be razed to the ground. The streets will be strewn with the dead bodies of Asaph's countrymen. Game over. End of story. God tried. People screwed up. God is done with his people. Israel was a failed experiment. People have this notion of an Old Testament God of wrath. Like a harsh, even abusive father You want something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. Vindictive, bloodthirsty, violent, all about penalty and curse. And if that's what was true about him, it would have ended with one of David's screw-ups. There have been a million mercies from David to Psalm 77. God has been gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And if this was the end of the story, we could still point to how generous and patient God was with that failed experiment, Israel. I've learned that in the school system now, it's gotten very hard to fail a student. School districts want teachers to send constant reminders, emails, messages to parents, giving opportunities to make up assignments. Picture a high school teacher who tries so hard to help a senior pass, but the senior doesn't show up for class, doesn't study, doesn't take the makeup opportunities. We would say the teacher was kind and gave every opportunity and finally let the student face the weight of their bad decisions. Here's where I want to go with this for you. God's a lot kinder than you thought. This is to feed your faith that God is gracious and compassionate, that he is faithful to his promises. Did you know Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, Kaniah? Did you know that he's mentioned in the New Testament? Most of you feel like you've never heard that name. He's in Matthew 1, verses 11 and 12. What's Matthew 1? Genealogy. He's not in the genealogy in Luke, though. As a youth pastor, I give my youth students permission to skim over the long genealogies in Scripture. Bad youth pastor. Maybe you've done that, too. Maybe you've skimmed over those genealogies. Did you realize that the genealogies in Matthew and Luke... Trace Jesus in different ways. In fact, I'd say that each of the four Gospels has a different genealogy for Jesus. And they each make sense. Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. And he shows the humanity of Jesus. So Luke traces Jesus all the way back to the first man, Adam. John shows the divinity of Jesus. Some would say John doesn't have a genealogy, but he does. His genealogy is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mark shows Jesus as a servant, and who cares about a servant's pedigree? Where Luke shows Jesus' humanity all the way back through Adam and through his fully human mother, Mary, Matthew is about Jesus as the Messiah, And he traces Jesus back to Abraham, who God covenanted with, through Jesus' adopted human father, Joseph. Joseph was a descendant of Jeconiah, the royal bloodline. It would seem Jesus is descended from David through both his mother's line and through his adopted father's line. He is the seed of David, the root of Jesse, by blood, and through the royal line, through adoption. God did not give up on his plan. 
He cursed, yes, but he blessed beyond the curse. And where Israel thought, when they saw the Messiah, that they would get a really good king, like David or Solomon, but maybe even better, what we got was so far greater. Not just a king for Israel, not just a super David, but a Messiah for all of humanity. Fully man, but also fully God. Not just a ruler, but also a servant. Not just a lion, but also a lamb. Not just a high priest, but also the real sacrifice that we needed more than anything to cover the penalty of our sin. Not just a teacher, but one who could go into our very hearts through his Holy Spirit and change us from the inside exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, so his plan was greater than we could have fathomed. And his plan to redeem mankind and to buy us out of the slave market of sin was not going to be stopped by generations of mediocre and terrible kings. Asaph was on the cusp of the end of the nation of Judah, The Davidic dynasty was circling the toilet bowl. The long dark nights of crying out, stretching out his hands and finding no comfort and there didn't seem to be a sunrise in sight. He did two things right that are instructional for us. One, he called out to God. Two, he looked at God's kindness and faithfulness to his people in the past. This is my admonition and message for you this week. Cry out in your affliction. Some of us have been far too quick to look to binging videos or turning to an addiction or carnal pleasures to distract us from the pain. We feel pain when we look at the disconnect between how things should be and how things are. Asaph says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. I charge you to be comforted by your father rather than by a pacifier. He is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Let let him be the lifter of your head. May that be your resolve this week. I pray that God would give you the courage to feel your feelings and to go to him instead of trying to find your refuge in something else. Baby steps. What about Bob? If you haven't been honest with God for years, and if you went to him for just five minutes before turning on the TV, you tell me that next week, Pastor Jeremy, I went to God for five minutes and then I turned on my show. We have to start somewhere. I will rejoice with you. Baby steps, these things are hard. And if you've been holding out on him and just pretending things are okay, if you've been pretending that you don't struggle with your faith or you don't struggle with that betrayal or disappointment, Maybe disappointment that he hasn't answered your biggest prayer. If you've been holding out on him, it's going to be really, really hard to talk to him about it. You might want to take a moment now, not at the end just yet, we're getting close. You might want to take a moment now, just as I'm talking, to say something like this. Lord, we both know I've been holding out. Would you help me to start to be more real with you? And would you help me to do this thing of making you my refuge? Maybe you would pray that now and start cracking that nut this week. As we've looked at some history, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. Good vision. I'm old enough, turning 40 next month. I'm old enough that my eyes are not what they used to be. When I started wearing glasses, even without them, I could still force my eyes to focus on 
tiny print, and I've lost that ability. When I take them off, I realize my lenses are stronger than they used to be. It's when you're wearing your glasses and trying hard and you still can't see that you realize your eyes are not what they used to be. I don't have 20-20 vision anymore. I could get eight and be in three confused. And when we're looking at what's scary and hard and uncomfortable in our lives and in the lives of those that we love, we don't see clearly what God is doing or how it could possibly be okay or how in a little while we could look back and give thanks for this thing that's happening now. And when we look to the future with our poor vision, it can look so chaotic and bleak. How's retirement going to work? This election, will my kid love Jesus? Am I stuck in this job? Is my marriage going to make it? This is where looking backward is so powerful. We can see so much more clearly than the psalmist. He had the exodus. We have Jesus. He looked back to God leading his people by the hand out of Egypt. We have a full Bible. And more than only the history of Scripture, try and forget for just a second the 100 problems that you have that God wants to work on with you. Remember the slavery to sin that he's led you out of already. Remember the the broken ways of thinking. We have some stories here in this church. I know many of you, my brothers and sisters, I know some of the stories that are represented in this room. We are some messy people. We have some messy stories, but as messy as we might be, remember what he's brought you out of. I'm remembering what he's brought me out of. Remember our broken family systems, addictions. Some of you might struggle with food or turning to a glass of wine right now, but for some it used to be hard drugs and the party scene. You might struggle with anger, but maybe you used to be violent. Some of us remember nursing bruised or broken knuckles for weeks. Some guys talking about that in the lobby after last service. You struggle with being a people pleaser, but he delivered you from being promiscuous. Look to what he's done in your life already. Admire his work. God has a completely perfect track record. He has never failed to be good and More than fair, he is unfair to us, toward us, in a good way. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He delivered the family of Abraham for Egypt. He set up a kingdom that can never be shaken. Even as we saw, when it seems like he's giving up and it's all over, he has not abandoned his promises or his plan to redeem and love. He does miracles. He's never cornered. Didn't it look like he'd painted himself into a corner there? He's not bound by what people have done. Look to what he's done in history and in your own life. And we can sing together, he was faithful then, and he'll be faithful now. Let's pray. And then let's worship him together. Our mouths are shut before you, Lord. Not mine, because you made me a preacher. We marvel at your mighty hand and what you have done. Sometimes we feel like your hand has changed and like you have forgotten your compassion and mercy. And you remind us you are not done Help us, Father, to believe that you are so much kinder than we have believed. Help us to scrub that idea that you are this vindictive, nasty Old Testament God. Help us to see 
you are like that kind teacher reaching out with chance after chance and you make it happen yourself. You're never defeated. Give us faith, Father, for the hard things that we face, the struggles that you have sovereignly allowed into our lives and in the lives of those that we love. Help us to cry aloud to you through the long nights. May we give up on our pacifiers and trust in our Father instead. Even when it doesn't make sense, you have proven yourself. Let us find our rest and our refuge in you, even this very week. In Jesus' name, for his glory, amen.